I'm Dan Clossy with the Town of Chevy Chase Climate and Environment Committee, and I'm the co-chair of the of uh, that committee. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this first webinar of our 2022 Green Town series. The webinar is being sponsored by the Town of Chevy Chase, but we've invited many Montgomery County communities and organizations to participate. So, so we provide as broad an exposure to this topic as we can. We'll have a good discussion and a Q&A about an important 2022 Maryland bill, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act. Before I turn it over to the panelists and the presenters, I need to cover a few administrative items. Um, so as I said, we'll have the presentation and then a Q&A session. We have a total of one and a half hours. If we finish early, we'll close the meeting early. Um, as I said, during the presentation, all the attendees are muted. If you're having some problem or issue, please use the chat function in Zoom and someone will help you. And um, you can pose a question uh, whenever you want. You should do that in the Q&A in general, um, the Zoom Q&A function. And when we get to that point, uh, one of the presenters will respond to the questions that appear there. If you would prefer to ask your question in person or live, or that would be more helpful, please put that note in the chat that you would like to do that. And when we have the appropriate moment, you will be unmuted and you'll be invited to ask your question um, and have a dialogue. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so be aware and the recording will be posted after the webinar. So without further ado, we're very pleased to have two representatives from Climate Exchange who will introduce themselves and their organization uh, in a minute. And they're gonna provide us an overview of this important 2022 Maryland legislation. The town of Chevy Chase has a long association with Climate Exchange which they will speak to. Our two panelists this evening are Hope Clark, who lives on the Eastern shore of Maryland and is a organizer for Maryland organizer for climate exchange. And Wandra Ashley Williams, who's from Baltimore County and she's the Maryland regional director of climate exchange. Hope and Wandra, thank you so much for being with us tonight and taking time out to be with us. So I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan and George um, and the town of Chevy Chase Environmental Committee for having us this evening. Of course, we know the town of Chevy Chase is very important because um, Jessica Langerman, I think is a resident there. And she um, of course is one of our founders, the founders of Climate Exchange. Um, and what Wandra and I uh, represent is Climate Exchange Maryland, which Jessica Langerland brought down from Massachusetts to Maryland. So um, we are the representatives of the campaign now here. Wandra, would you like to say a few words? Um, thank you for inviting us here tonight. We do appreciate that and giving us an opportunity to talk about this very important uh, legislation. As Hope said that we are, Climate Exchange is an organization that is based in Boston. Uh, however, we reach all over the country. We have a huge, over 15,000 people in our state network. Uh, our main um, concentration is reducing carbon in our atmosphere. And we have two campaigns, one in Massachusetts and one here in Maryland to get legislation passed. Jessica was on the national, I mean, not the national, on the board of directors for the organization and lived down here. And she and Pete Smith uh, both were uh, board members and they thought that we needed to have this legislation passed in Maryland. And they are the two that started the effort here. And so we have to thank them for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Hope. She's going to do the presentation tonight. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. 
All right, so I'll just share my screen and start the presentation. We are talking about the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act in the House, number 171, and in the Senate, 135, pre-filed, um, which is supposedly supposed to help us become a little earlier in the session, but you never know what's really gonna happen. So of course, um, Rebuild Maryland Coalition is actually um, what I coordinate, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, to just you know, frame uh, climate exchange and its mission to achieve a durable, just transition away from polluting fossil fuels in the United States by advancing climate policy at the state level. So I know you know we all like to work as well at the federal level, but this specifically is state level work, which lets and allows us to be a little bit more local, which can be kind of exciting. And primarily what we do is advocacy. We work alongside frontline communities, unions, teachers, students, executive branch and municipal officials, industry leaders, and build coalitions, both in Maryland and Massachusetts. We're leveraging our network of media partners, legislators, and business leaders to push carbon pollution pricing bills across the finish line. Tremendous job. And so just to go further into what the Rebuild Maryland Coalition is, we're a diverse group of stakeholders working to establish practical solutions to reduce harmful air, air pollutants, such as greenhouse gas emissions, hold polluters responsible for the damage they have caused, and put frontline communities first while protecting the health, economic well-being, and natural treasures of Maryland. So if you have to go soon or you want to go back to these slides, this is our contact information. You're always welcome to reach out to us. Uh, we love to hear from any constituents, uh, members of Maryland, and anyone really in general. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about that Rebuild Maryland Coalition. This diverse group of stakeholders have come together to, to develop principles. Um, and this is really important because it is these principles that guide the writing and, and creation of the legislation. And our very first principle is putting people first. When you go to our website, which I'll be putting the link into the chat, you can see um, these principles in deeper um, definition. These are just a general sort of um, statement about the principle, but there's, there's depth to them as well. But number two, of course, equity issues must be front and center as we're designing our legislation. We want to make sure to achieve the greenhouse gas reduction mandates. We want to make sure that we're creating economic and public good. We want to create quality jobs and we need to invest in electric transportation. And so these are um, a sampling of our um, partners. Not all our partners have logos, but these is a good, good chunk of them. We just recently got the mayor of Salisbury, which is exciting. And we're hoping to get the whole uh, municipal league of um, to, to join us because our legislation is really exciting this year in, in what it can do for smaller municipalities and cities and counties. Um, but you can see the diversity here. So that's really exciting. So I'm going to talk really, you know, kind of in general about the, the, the law, and I encourage you guys to ask questions as well. Um, we have, you know, the sponsor in the House is David Frazier Hidalgo, and Senate sponsor is Ben Kramer from Montgomery County. So, um, you know, that kind of makes sense um, that, that they would be the ones to... Um, to sponsor. They're very supportive and fantastic sponsors, actually, that really do believe in the bill. And when we're creating legislation, of course, when we're looking at the climate, um, the target that we set is very important. And this particular bill pushes the state-wide greenhouse gas emission reduction goals further than what they presently are. Um, those goals to reduce harmful pollutants using the 2006 emission levels as a baseline. Right now, the state has a 40% by 2030. The Maryland Commission on Climate Change has recommended 50% by 2030, but this law targets 60% by 2030. 100% by 2040 and zero emissions by 2040. And that's really important because of the way that we do it and what's needed because of the social cost actually of carbon. 
But also important is that these goals complement existing programs like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And if you're not familiar with that, it's um, another type of carbon pricing policy, different than the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, but also a carbon pricing policy. It's a cap and trade policy that actually is a regional effort with the states of Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Virginia. Pennsylvania governor has been working really hard to join us. Uh, he's been having some challenges, but um, we encourage that state to join us as well. And this is just a general kind of um, graph of, of what how Maryland has been benefiting. You can see $669 million um, have come in between 2008 and 2019. Now, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, if it is implemented, would be quite a bit more revenue. And that's why it's so exciting. And we really, you know, think it would be amazing and important to actually pass. Um, but you can see the benefits here that in energy efficiency, you know, 28.9% of those funds are going towards energy efficiency. Clean and renewable energy is another hunk. Uh, greenhouse gas abatement. Um, there's a little bit for administration, um, but there's a nice hunk, like almost 50% that goes directly to bill assistance. And that's very important, right? We, you know, people need help. Um, and that's part of this work is to um, take the proceeds of, of, of something that is really causing harm and help out folks to get through it, you know, to get through every day. So if you have some questions about the way carbon pricing works, I encourage you to go to our website and watch some videos that explain it. Um, it's, it's, you know, once you kind of take a little time to study it, it's not that complex, the difference between a cap and trade policy and a carbon tax or fee and invest policy. And that's what we call the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, a carbon fee and invest policy. So why do we call it a fee and how does it work? How do we get that revenue, that tremendous amount of revenue in order to heal the harm from our changing climate? With the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, we, we put a fee on two types of fuel, non-transportation fuel and transportation fuel. They're two different prices. Um, transportation fuel is is, is um, responsible for a much larger part of the emissions. So with a lower price, you're still getting quite a bit of revenue. Um, the building, you know, sort of non-transportation fuel that we're using, um, we start at $15 per ton. And you can see this incrementally rising fee. And why do we do that? We do that in order to create a predictable market signal for businesses to prepare for this big shift away from using this product that is so embedded in our economy. And that's really important. It's a, it's a responsible bill really to shift us away because it's predictable and we can prepare for it. What's also really important is that by 2030, we've got a price of $50 per CO2 ton and that's what economists have determined to be the social cost. And so that's really important but we have to start soon, we have to start this year. Then we have, you know, roughly a billion dollars. Maybe we don't have our fiscal note yet, but you know, it could be a little bit under a billion this year, it could be a little over a billion next year. That's what the fiscal note said last time, last year. Whatever it is, it's, you know, millions of dollars, right? And the way we've designed it is to go back into two separate funds. One being a benefit fund, 80 of which goes back to low and moderate income families to just make sure that they are completely protected. That fee, there is a no, um, no pass-through provision for that fee so that the companies are not allowed to pass that cost down to the end user. But still, we want to make sure that households, especially low and moderate income families, are protected. And that rebate goes back to families just like we got our stimulus checks with COVID. 20% of that benefit fund is allocated to energy intensive trade exposed businesses 
Um, 6% of the GDP of Maryland are man is manufacturing, and we want to make sure that they're protected because their margin of profit is so thin. And then the really exciting design is the infrastructure half. So when we're talking about infrastructure, we need to, and, and, and developing, right, the new sustainable economy and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to understand really clearly where are our emissions coming from? And a couple of counties have local action plans. Montgomery County has one, Baltimore County has one. Other counties are developing them. But we want to really provide funding up to 5% is about 25 million to 500 million. And, and that would provide enough for each county, each municipality to, um, to create a plan. And then to implement that plan, right? Because Baltimore County, Montgomery County have plans, but they don't really have, they are talking about needing money to implement them. So, but we also want to make sure that the folks who are harmed the, mo the most come first. So at least 50% of that, the infrastructure funds to implement, have to be prioritizing communities who have been affected by environmental injustice. And then their other hunk of money up to 50%. So this at least an up to you know, there's a there's flexibility here because every year a new plan is created of how to spend the money to implement to implement those those climate action plans. So how does that work? I kind of just wanted to, um, you know, discuss the fact that Maryland's Department of Environment has a Maryland Commission on Climate Change um, and that has several different working groups that are studying sort of you know, emissions and how to reduce them um, in the different areas of our state. Um, and we've also created a, a commission for environmental justice and sustainable communities to focus on those communities and how to help them. So this bill will be working very closely with these commissions and the, and the Department of Environment, but it also creates its own council to make sure that this particular set of funds created by this bill is, is being allocated the way it's designed. And that's the, the Climate Crisis Council, um, which is created of a House member, a Senate member, uh, lead economists, scientists, environmental justice specialists, and community members. So of course, um, there are you know, several ways to support this bill. Right now, our hearing is February 15th, which is not very far away. Um, and so, you know, you can sign on as an individual, you can sign on as an organization um, to become a member of the coalition. Uh, we also have a sign on for elected officials, if there happens to be any council members or mayors or any representatives um, that watch this video or are on tonight. Um, and we also have a companion bill called the New Motor Vehicle um, high pollution fee, which is, is something that used to be embedded in the bill last year, but now has its own um, little bill with its own numbers, HB 060 and the Senate bill number 126. Um, and it will have actually a hearing on the same day. And there's ways to support that too separately, which is a very similar type of um, bill that puts a fee on high polluting vehicles, creates a bit of revenue that goes back to develop um, electric transportation infrastructure and give rebates to folks. So that is um, the end of the presentation right now. And I can see there's a few questions, um, maybe some things in the chat. So um, would somebody like to, to ask a question? I'm gonna put in the, um, some links in the chat at this point. Okay. Well, there are some questions sitting in the Q&A. If you uh, wanna click over there and um, you, know, you can answer, answer those verbally or you know, okay. the, the way Zoom works, you type an answer, but you can just answer them verbally. 
Okay, if not otherwise addressed by the presentation, please explain why the fee is assessed only on the importation of fossil fuels in the state and why is this approach, why this approach does not create constitutional issues with the commerce clause. Um, okay, um, actually the, the bill puts a fee as the, as the fuels coming into the state, but also as it's generated in the state. Right, so there is still a bit of coal generated and burned in the state, as well as natural gas, and actually the methane that is leaked out of the natural gas distribution um, is measured through CO2 equivalents, and that's another way that, that we are um, gathering a fee. Um, but your question about um, why this approach does not create constitutional issues with the Commerce Clause, can you go answer that one, Wandra? And answer it by saying the our sponsors did take this to the attorney general and he approved it so i cannot give you the details but i will talk to them and find out uh what the attorney general had to say about that but according to our sponsors and this happened when we first started writing uh the bill they did uh go to the attorney general and um, address that so we can follow up with you on that Thank you for that question. So we'll um, go to the next question. Uh, why is there no fee on fossil fuels used to generate electricity? Uh, see page 11, line seven to 11. Is that, where, what are you referring to oh, in the? Hope I can answer that too real quick. Mm -hmm. It was in the initial bill, we did put a, a fee on electricity. The bill was so complicated. We had the electricity, we had um, the high uh, emission vehicles, and, and we just thought that we needed to simplify the bill to get it started, because we have to start somewhere. And so it was pulled out. Now, just like we have a standalone bill for the high uh, emission vehicles, the uh, sponsors are looking at a standalone bill for electricity. Okay. Everything I've read on this issue says that the fee has to be much, much higher than that is what you've presented. Why are we not working for fees that won't just be the cost of doing business? Yeah, good question, Betsy. I mean, I think, um, you know, I pointed out that by 2030, the fee being $50, um, at least is there, uh, that's the low edge of what economists say needs to needs the fee to be. It's really 50 to 100. Um, actually, there's a little video on our website with a uh, recent economist, journalist um, talking about this. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it, it is a good question. Why aren't we doing more? And, and, you know, but I think that number one, it's kind of that predictable, um, that kind of gradual thing that has to happen in order to not, because remember that principle of sort of economic and public good, other countries have tried to do things really fast and it completely backlashes and then they don't get anywhere. And that's what we don't want to have happen, right? We want to do this in a way that makes it happen sort of seamlessly and moves us into the right direction. Of course, every minute that we don't do it, the faster we must do it. But, you know, that's kind of the best answer I can give you right now, Betsy, but I, I, I hear your frustration. Do you have anything else, Wondra, about that? Yes, that we give, we'll give the industry an opportunity to, to look at cleaner ways to provide energy, right? Um, and that's what we want. That's what we want. And, and, the, the, the uh, Climate Crisis Council has an opportunity to increase the fee if they feel it's necessary over the years. We'll just see how it pro progresses, and they do have an opportunity to do that if they feel that it's necessary. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of this bill, actually, is that is the I think that the design is clear enough about its intention and at the same time flexible enough to really uh, make it work. And it really pushes the democracy of the state too. I mean, people come forward with their areas and with their issues and they, they, they let the Climate Crisis Council know that they need that revenue. It's a process. 
So the next question, please explain if fossil fuel importers cannot pass the fee on to end users, how do individuals and businesses experience the fee? I think, means how, I think it means how do individuals and businesses experience the fee? Uh huh. It appears, so, for example, that gas distribution can pass on the fee if approved by the PUC. Well, how do they experience? How do they uh, how do they deal with the fee? I think they just have to pay it. Uh, you know, it has to go into their profits. Is the is the idea that they they have to swallow it, right? They've been profiting out of this. Uh, you know the the destruction for for a very long time. The whole, I think the, is that right? I think the, I think the question is if there's a no pass through clause as part of the bill. Mm -hmm. How do how do individuals and businesses? Oh right, and business. Sorry, fee? not the, the companies. Right. How do they experience the fee? Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's it. it you know, hopefully they don't. <laughs> I mean, that's there. There's a little bit of a catch twenty two there. Um, yeah, and let me just say, you're you're right, Hope. Uh, the way it is uh, structured, they should not experience a fee. But if for some reason this bill or this this legislation is challenged in court, right, and for whatever reason, the fee is allowed to be passed down. That is one of the reasons we do have the benefits fund to compensate for those individuals who really cannot afford to pay an increase and have been damaged most over the years. The other side of it is we all have to really work together to turn this around, okay? And so those who can afford to pay an extra amount of money, you know, they might get hit, might get hit with a fee or an increase, a slight increase. But the way it's structured right now, that will not happen because of the no pass through. The attorney general did say that, that it was legal to put it in the legislation and that they would be prepared to defend it. We do know that there's another bill that passed just last session. Uh, I think it was around the internet that used the exact language and it, and it did pass. And so uh, I believe our attorney general is prepared to defend uh, the no pass through. Okay. Um, and Sheila's asking, how likely is this bill to pass? Um, you know, we are the advocates. So, you know, our, what we do is work with communities like you to tell their legislators you want it passed. And that's how it will get passed. Um, I think it's likely to pass in Maryland. You know, we, we, there is this, this bill, this type of legislation is in other states and has yet to actually break through. But I think Maryland has a good opportunity to, to be the state that, that does break it through because, um, Lots of people are showing interest and and see how it and you know see how it works and see the benefits of this kind of revenue. It's a lot of revenue, and we need a lot of revenue in order to prepare for, you know, just the resilience against the disasters that have already are already coming to us, but also to build the infrastructure for the change that we need to be able to survive. Um, I'm just learning, Joy says, I'm just learning about this bill. Can you explain the case for legislation from the ground up? For example, do we know the level of emissions occurring now and how much we intend to reduce? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, right, the, the, the figure that I've had is, I think, the emissions in 2017. It takes a while for um, the kind of calculations of, of how many emissions have been done, um, but we can see, you know, emissions from, five years ago. Um, and then we've got that target that if you missed the beginning of the presentation, um, it's uh, reducing emissions 60% um, by 2030 from the baseline levels of 2006. So that's the target. Um, and what are the impacts experienced by certain communities slated to receive assistance from the fee and investment? Um, well, if you're low and moderate income, then you you receive that rebate, right? So, if for any reason 
um, you know, your building heat goes up or there's some rising gas, um, you have funds coming in to make up for that. Um, so that would be, you know, the experience would be just receiving cash to handle any kind of bills that you have. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't see that question. Could you read it again? Yeah, Joy, the first part was about um, explaining the case for the legislation from the ground up. For example, knowing the level of emissions occurring now and how much we intend to reduce. So that was about the targets kind of that the bill has. And then what are the impacts experienced by certain communities slated to receive assistance from fee and investment? So how would the low and moderate income families be affected by the rebates? I think is that what, that's what that question is. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, um, what they meant by the impact. Um, the, the, um, there shouldn't be, the impact will be really saving lives, to be very honest with you, in your community, uh, because we'll have reduced carbon in our atmosphere. That is, we will we'll all be uh, impacted by that. But the communities, the frontline communities, the African-American communities are the ones that are most affected right now by the climate crisis. We know that to be a fact, okay? And they're affected by so many ways, health issues. We know about, you know, asthma, but it goes beyond asthma. You know, heart disease, lung disease, um, just some cancer, so many areas. And so uh, by reducing the carbon, needless to say, hopefully we're going to, hopefully we will reduce the incidence of uh, emergency vis uh, room visits. Of people getting sick. So, and let's, 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 the Eastern Shore, you know, Baltimore City, uh, Ellicott City, with, with the flooding that happens continuously. So, heat, you know, when it gets hot, we, we have schools where our children have to go to school with no air conditioning. And in May, sometimes it's 80, 90 degrees. And so, so there are a lot, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we answer the question and uh, I'm not sure that we are hitting the target. So maybe the person who asked the question can let us know if we are actually answering our question properly. Yeah, if you're, this is Dan, um, if you're um, asking a question and you're feeling like you didn't get the complete answer, feel free to do one of two things. You can repost a question and we'll keep going through the questions and ask for a clarification. Or if you, it would be easier if you post in the chat, um, we can unmute you and we can have a live conversation about any particular topic someone might wanna talk about. So uh, take one of those two paths and we'll keep plowing through the questions and keep going until we're done. Okay. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, Sally Kelly's asking, discuss how the state level carbon bills relate to businesses that operate across state lines. That is, is there the hope or expectation that in encountering many bills in various states, businesses may be moved to be more accepting of federal legislation? Yeah, I I, yeah Sally, I think that's, that's a great um, sort of comment question. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think, yeah, the, I'm not, I don't, you know, Wanda might be able to speak a little bit more specifically um, to sort of the crossing the state lines piece of it. Um, I think that, you know, from being a, a cli citizen's climate lobby group leader and liaison myself working at the federal level, to me, it's really exciting now to be working at the state level because I do believe that at the state level, we can be pushing uh, the feds eventually to, to, uh, to make this a national uh, policy. Um, yeah, um, we're charging here in the state and we're hoping that other states will start to do the same thing. And that is what we're working toward. And there are other states that are looking at uh, you know, putting a price on carbon, carbon and charging the polluters. Um, and so 
And it, of course, at the federal level, they are looking at doing the same thing. So that's how it's going to be addressed. Eventually, eventually we have to turn this thing around. Eventually, there's no way we can continue as a planet, <laughs> living on this planet, if we don't turn this thing around. And um, there are efforts all over the country to do just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of good questions, right? Um, Michael's asking if Congress were to enact a carbon fee at the federal level, is Maryland bill impacted? Actually, the bill addresses that, it written in the bill that if a federal policy is enacted, Maryland comes to comply, or if our bill is stronger than the F, the feds, we keep stronger. Um, I believe that's the case. So there's a there is a consciousness that if the if the federal carbon fee and dividend policy gets enacted, Maryland knows how to respond and react. I hope that answers your question. Also, Dave Whelan is asking um, over here, how are we responding to the, crit the critique that the measure would threaten Maryland commercial competitiveness? Um, that was, that's in our, um, the 20% the, the of the benefit fund going to um, energy intensive uh, trade exposed businesses maybe is what you're talking to Steve um, because six percent of the GDP of Maryland is manufacturing and there I, I sort of mentioned that um, the their margin of error uh, for profit is so small we don't want to hurt their uh, businesses and we don't want them to get to uh, start to actually do things that create more emissions so there's there's some uh, protection for them. Um, so there, there's some protection for them as far as uh, threatening their competitiveness. Back to Susanna Cardenas, how do you select the states in which you carry out advocacy? Florida is a challenging conser con conservative, <laughs> even purple environment, and the population seems increasingly sensitive to the impacts of the climate crisis. It really is. Yeah, Florida is really in, in, is very, very vulnerable. Um, yeah, let me, it, that is difficult because we, we really, we looked at Mexico, we looked at uh, Minnesota, um, actually we had a big uh, conference here in Montgomery County a couple of years ago to really look at where we should go next with this. Now, as far as climate exchange is concerned, we are just, uh, actually just gave an offer to a new executive director who actually lived in Florida for a while, and she's in Texas now, who's coming aboard. And we are looking at um, what our vision is going to be going toward the future and how we're going to approach just that. So that's a good question, a timely question. Hopefully once she's on board and we have an opportunity to put our heads together, I'll be able to give you a more definitive answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Wilkov again, wouldn't it pass through um, encourage individuals and businesses to look to renewable energy? Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, the, the sort of traditional carbon fee and dividend policy um, does the cost goes all the way down to the end user. And that is the the um, the mechanism in which people start to shift away. Um, and at the federal level, that's a, a possible sort of thing to do. Um, but at the state level, it's it's a lot harder to pass something like that. Um, and that's why we've sort of made the compromise of, um, of, of, of causing of, you know, creating the fee, creating the revenue, and then bringing it back. Um, and just Steve is addressing the state, county, and municipal administration's existing buildings and truck fleets. Will their increased cost prices be passed along to raise taxes? That's actually part of the the um, the infrastructure fund, right? Is giving those local counties and municipalities money to create their climate action plans and their programs and their. Um, you know, to reduce emissions. And they can go to the Climate Crisis Council and say, we need some of that revenue in order to make our truck fleet electric or our buildings electric. Um, so it's really designed to incentivize those local communities, municipalities, and counties to start 
pushing the um, their infrastructure to be more sustainable and providing the revenue for that. That's what I think is the beauty of this of this bill. Um, another anonymous attendee, why shouldn't the consumers of fossil fuels pay the fee for the damages that using these fuels cause? Perhaps those individuals who buy and drive gas guzzle vehicles should pay the cost associated with the emissions for all the gas they use. Perhaps people considering whether to buy a home heated or natural gas as opposed to electricity should pay the cost reflecting the damages that burning got, um, natural gas causes. Seems to me that giving consumers an appropriate price signal to guide their energy usage decisions might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what we're trying to do, though, is to, to, to protect like the most vulnerable, right? So those rebates that are going to the low and moderate income families are folks that um, can't really afford to make those changes as far as driving, um, you know, an electric vehicle. Um, and so, so it, you know, folks who are making incomes on the 60 to 100 scale, right, in the quintiles of four and five, um, they will be, you know, doing all that they that, that probably to make those shifts. But you're also addressing the anonymous attendee, um, the our companion bill, right? Because the new motor vehicle high pollution fee bill precisely puts a fee on those um, more emitting vehicles, ones that, um, you know, operate at 13 miles per gallon or less, they, they have to pay a little bit of a fee. And that fund would go back to rebates for electric cars, electric car infrastructure, um, electric buses, and electric public transportation. So um, in the chat, I've actually put um, a letter campaign, the new motor vehicle high pollution fee bill letter campaign. So if you're interested in that bill, I encourage you to write your representatives, let them know that you would like that passed. Um, and just to let you know, also, we have the Climate Crisis Environmental Justice Letter Campaign link there too, and I encourage everybody on this call to um, write their representatives and let them know that you'd like these pass, these bills passed if, you, if they do sound good to you. And share with your friends and neighbors across the state. <laughs> um, then we still have some more questions. Joy White, thank you. That's very helpful. Wandra? <laughs> Steven Sparenborg. I'm not sure what she was thanking you for, but Deborah was thanking us oh, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, for <laughs> providing clarity on how you took the account, the legal and political considerations on what would be needed to give this legislation a chance to get enacted along with the flexibility to build on this initial approach in the future years. Um, I'm, let me and, just say this, guys, about... about um, the future of this bill, we're gonna be realistic here. This is an election year, right? From the governor on down, every seat in the General Assembly is up. And, and with that um, presents a challenge for anything that has a fee attached. But I think with this one, this particular legislation, it's not just the fee, this is a true environmental justice bill. This bill is going to really take care of those people who have been injured the most by carbon. And it's going to help move us toward that goal quicker. We're talking about 20, that's only eight years, not a long time. And we can't continue to kick the can down the road. We have to take a stand at some point. And it would be great if, if Maryland would take that stand and send a message to the other states that, you know, this is what you need to do. We need to move this, but we are being realistic. That's why Hope keeps stressing, we need you. Voters, I mean, uh, 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 lawmakers, uh, they listen to their constituents, right? They listen to their constituents. And if they know that, especially in election year, that this is a bill that you want passed, then they're more likely to listen to you than to listen to lobbyists coming to them saying, look, we want this bill passed. But we have to really be real, realistic and understand that, um, you know, what, what we usually call, this is a silly season. This, this is a serious election year here in Maryland. And we have the same scenario in Massachusetts, the same scenario. It's just that they have a longer session than we, you know, we only have but 90 days. They have, what, a year and a half or something. And I just wanted to, you know, stress that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I put it on this, the newsletter sign up for in the chat as well. Um, this coming uh, newsletter for this month, we have um, some focus on environmental justice and the tools that we do have in Maryland in order to um, identify the communities that are affected. Um, and, you know, Wanderers, you know, this is Black History Month, so Wanderers really uh, written a beautiful piece about that as well. And so I just encourage folks to, to sign up for that every month. We uh, just, you know, put out articles that are relevant to the legislation and what we're thinking about in our coalition. Um, Stephen Sparenborg has another question referring to the bill's target, that 60% by 2030, or a mission statement, polluters must pay something. If I were a polluter or a legislator and defended myself by saying that I am only giving the people what they want and what the people want is gasoline, how would such a defense be countered when the bill is discussed? Well, I mean, that's what like the whole country and world is saying, right? Like, I just want my gasoline, <laughs> right? I don't want to change. We've been doing this for 50 years. What's wrong? But I mean, the last year alone in Maryland has suffered $5 billion disasters. That's a lot of money, right? We can't afford it. We just can't afford it. And municipalities, the folks who actually are responsible, the mayors and council members, um, that are sitting and trying to look at these budgets when when people's roofs fly off, <laughs> they they're looking you know they're looking for an answer, and we just we just have to make a you know we have to change and we can change, right? It doesn't have to be excruciating, um, you know. It's it, it's it's we have a lot more at our fingertips these days, right? Um, we have used hybrid vehicles we can buy and wow, we don't have to pay that much for gas if we have to drive to work every day. Um, you know, now we're getting rebates for electric pumps and we can think about changing our homes if we if we have that capacity. Um, I think there's you know, I mean, I could go on. I used to be a dancer and I made a whole piece on addiction because you know, when you have to get over an addiction, you have to face truths and it's very cleansing actually. And so it might be a good thing. <laughs> okay. Wander, you want to say anything or I'll go to the next one. So no, I just, I just see um, uh, someone who says Steve mentioned the uh, EJ screen. Mm -hmm. That is in our newsletter. That is one of the tools that uh, Hope addresses in the newsletter. Yeah, yeah, Steve, Steve, um, Steve actually, I think actually pointed me towards that climate equity um, mapper. So thank you, Steve, and the MoCo equity focus area. That's cool. Um, okay, Sheila Bloom, yes, to Sally's question, federal laws are crucial, but I don't see what's that happening um, in this political climate right now. Uh, Steven Sparenberg, not a question, but a thought regarding the high polluting vehicle tax, if Bill doesn't if this bill doesn't inflict a painfully high tax, is it merely allows the owners to write the right to pollute as much as they want. Having paid as an easy to afford tax, they will feel entitled to pollute risky. It must inflict pain to change behavior. If mm -hmm. I had um, my choice, I, I, I definitely would inflict pain. <laughs> I would do that. Mm -hmm. But we have to look at the political climate. Uh, but one thing that we are also hoping is that is going to change the dealers, okay? They're, they will, we're hoping that they will bring less uh, gas customers to their lots if they know they have to explain or they have to see posted an extra fee for that gas customer. When you can get in that same model, you know, uh, di a different type of vehicle. So, um, that's what we're hoping. The whole trend it will help to to uh, change the whole trend. Yeah, and you know, I if um, if there are more electric vehicles available, if there's more you know opportunity to uh, rent a home or buy a home that doesn't use oil or gas, we will go there. I mean, we're not in a fossil fuel economy because we chose it, are we? We're in a fossil fuel economy because the fossil fuel companies really designed that for us, right? So you know we. As we make the shift, 
um, we're we're going to go that way because it's it's going to be the healthier, cleansier, you know, more uh, um, just um, smarter way to to live. Um, well, it is, you know, I think we're out of the questions here. Let's see. Um, six measures some. Sorry, see, so you're saying that you were on another environmental agenda call listing six current measures, some with no um, House bills and, and Senate numbers, but I didn't see the CCEJ bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's part of, um, they have this initiative for the Climate Solution Now. Uh, I think in one house it's one bill and in the other it's a, a whole mixture of bills. And um, that is what Senator Pinsky, that's his bill. Um, I don't know which, which uh, meeting you were in, so I, I really can't address that. But I do know that there, are, there is a whole package of bills, environmental bills. They will all be heard, not they all be, this one particular one will be heard along with our bills on the 15th of, um, of February. So um, the, the legislature is determined to, to pass um, climate related legislation this year. So which bill they end up passing, I can't say, but they are committed to passing some type of climate legislation this year. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one thing that we can say is that the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act is one of the few bills that actually creates the amount of revenue needed in order to make the shift. And while we do have federal funds coming in for this one year, um, you know, this bill with the incrementally rising fee creates a lot of revenue for several years. Um, and so, you know, this bill doesn't go in contrast with any of those other bills. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to figure out what you want to support, you can support them all because they're all needed. And, and, and I, I dare say, uh, I have to look at all of the bills. I've looked at some of them. Um, we can definitely fund, we not we, but this, this legislation can definitely fund some of those uh, policies, mainly because of the way the bill is structured. Right, we have the infrastructure fund, and we have um, the climate crisis council, where funding is available to approve projects. And if 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 uh, funding is needed for a certain bill, all they have to do is bring it to that particular uh, bring it to the council, and it can be passed. So um, we, we're looking at. We have a researcher who has done research on the current VR language, and we will realize at least a billion dollars the first year, at least a billion dollars. And of course, more as we go on, and then it should level off. So, um, so we're looking at 10 years over, I think it was $11 billion over 10 years. Um, so Steve also, you know, just to let you know that as a coalition, um, as Climate Exchange Maryland, you know, we can, we sign on and support a lot of the bills that are listed um, that might have been, you know, what you were listening to. Um, you know, we have some criteria as to how, you know, which ones we sign on to, but the way that you know, it works in Maryland is that there's sort of several different coalitions that have different priorities. Um, so, um, you know, while it appears kind of confusing, we are working together. <laughs> it is very confusing this year. I'll tell you that. It is very confusing. But the one thing that, that we have in our coalition is that we have a very diverse coalition not just our your, your typical climate and environmental organizations, which we do have and we need them, but we also have labor unions. We have education. We have civil rights, human rights organizations, uh, um, medical, healthcare, religious, because we believe that we all have to breathe clean air 
and we're all in the boat together and we have to turn it around together. So that's the one thing that we pride ourselves in bringing together the entire state behind this legislation. Well, Jessica says she has to go. So I just wanted to thank her so much for her, you know, um, innovation and determination and persistence to start this campaign in this state. Um, I think it's, you know, she's really a visionary and, um, you know, has started an incredible organization. Climate Exchange has just done amazing things um, with the climate, State Climate Policy Network. So uh, thanks so much, Jessica. You know, I love you, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we really we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Jessica. That's great. Be very honest. Yeah. Stewart Sessions, are there other comprehensive climate bills likely to be submitted in the Maryland legislature this session? If there are, do you think there could be some sort of cooperation between the sponsors of each, maybe coalescing around the best features of each, or maybe it's too early for this? Yeah, they. I think they are, co I think they are talking to each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, there are um, a lot of there are a lot it's of bills. Tell. There are a lot of bills. And I wish they would talk more, to be very honest with you. But they are. They are putting their heads together. And uh, but right now, they're focused on election. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, making sure they can stay in the General Assembly. So yeah. who knows? I, I can say one thing, um, Stuart, is that you know, the Justice 40 mandate, which is coming down from the federal government. Um, like Delaware already is implementing that, but there's a bill that um, specifically focuses on the Justice 40 for Maryland. And, um, you know, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act, I just want to say, has 50%. So it goes beyond that Justice 40 mandate that prioritizes those communities that have been affected by environmental injustice. So we've worked really hard to create the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act to really be something that speaks to the largest needs of the state when it comes to climate action, just climate action. And we need all of the other bills. This cannot do it alone. There's no way. So this is just a start. Uh, we need all of the, the legislation that's out there so we can you know, move forward. So that's why we, we work together with, with all of the, um, all of them that makes sense we work as much as possible to help promote those. All right, hope I'm, this is Dan again. I'm not seeing any new questions uh, in either the chat or the Q&A. People, we still open. So if people wanna get in their last shot, please feel free. Um, do, but do, did you and, uh, do you and Wander wanna, do you have any other, kind of closing comments and sort of, you've already put the call to action uh, links in the chat, I believe, but that's sort of the, the takeaway, hopefully, is if people want to support this bill or these bills, mm -hmm. you, they've got the links to send messages to their legislators. Yeah, um, I think I also, you know, put in the some sample testimony, which I didn't talk about yet, um, for each bill. And so, um, for folks who like to write, who like to, you know, sort of talk about why something's important, um, we really do encourage you to submit testimony. You don't have to, you know, upload it yourself. The way that it works in Maryland is people have to create an account and upload it, but you can just send it to us. I'm going to put my email in the chat again, um, but also if you, you know, have experience with this and you want to um, do oral testimony. You know, in the Senate, I think now we're going to be in person. Um, so if you feel like coming to, you know, Annapolis and testifying, we encourage you to do that as well. Talk to us, come, you know, tell us what you want to say or just sign up, you know. Um, we do want folks to uh, voice their passion about this issue. And if you think this bill is great and you you want, you know, you want to talk about it, or you want to talk about the effects of climate change and how important it is to take action and, and pass this bill, that'd be great. All right. Well, thank you. I still see no more new questions. So I think we will 
bring this to a close. Um, obviously, we uh, we have a big challenge in front of us with the climate crisis, and uh, this bill would be a, a stepping stone, hopefully, to really getting some additional action started in the state of Maryland. And we all know what the challenges are at the federal level. So I saw a bumper sticker today that I thought about in terms of this process. And it, the bumper sticker was, I don't know the history of the bumper sticker, but it's, we won't be better until we all do better. Um, you know, probably if people are on this call, they're, they're doing stuff to help with our climate crisis, but hopefully we'll get to a critical mass where legislation like this can pass. And as Wander pointed out, it's an election year. It's a hard vote, but um, the more people who communicate to our legislators, they will hopefully do the right thing and we'll get, we'll get this ball rolling or get some of the balls rolling on some of the bills in the legislature this year. So yeah. Hope and Wander, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us and uh, getting us this information about this bill and actions that we can take. We really appreciate your time and attendance and the attendees. I know some have already started to depart, but appreciate everyone's time and attention on this. And if you're, if you feel moved, please do take action uh, to help us with the climate crisis. So uh, with that, I'm hoping, Wander, unless you have any final comments, we'll, we'll close and just thank you for the invitation. We, we truly appreciate it and uh, really enjoyed the conversation tonight. Likewise. Well, thank you and thank all the attendees for being here and uh, have a good evening. Uh, if anyone's interested in the recording, you can let us know and uh, we can get a copy of the recording. It'll be posted on the town of Chevy Chase website. Right. And somebody asked about the chat too. You can save your chat, I think. And, and I think that the webinar will save the chat too. Exactly. That's right. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Thank evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.